Well, we, we move out of the discussion of the hypostatic union, leave it as something that overwhelms, causes you to realize this, that which is entirely unique. And we come to what I've called becoming human, what it tests. And this is very briefly done. I've given you just two verses of scripture. It tests the correctness of one's belief about Jesus Christ. I'm thinking of 1 John 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit, of course, that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Spirit of Antichrist. Hallmark of false teachers, as we mentioned before, is their very quick desire to re redefine Christ so that the picture they present is not the same as that of Scripture. Denial of his humanity. I cross reference to Second John, verse 7. Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh is deceiver and antichrist. I find it interesting reflecting on those verses and looking back particularly after reading something like Walter Martin's Kingdom of the Cults to realize how swift these different groups, false teachers, have denied Christ coming in the flesh. Some way of brought out that denial. And I asked myself, what is it that causes them to attack that particular point? And my simple answer is because his humanity is so clear on the pages of Scripture, they've got to do something to elevate their own authority in giving a revelation of Christ that is somewhat different. Or it's just plain, sinful disobedience to Scripture. It's plain, so it can't be accepted. You accept him as the one who came in the flesh, son of God, son of man, or you are wrong to the Scripture. It's that simple. If the, if the answer is wrong, you're wrong. There's no possibility of debate try and sort this out. You're wrong. Personally, I use Second John 7 as the, the reason why JWs are not invited into my home. If we talk, if, and I usually don't, it'll be at the door. They don't come into my home. And I never say anything like, have a good day because I don't wish, want to wish anything good on their activities. I will say something to the effect that you are a deceiver in your denial of Christ coming in the flesh. That's my personal reaction. What did it mean, however, for sonship? is an interesting question to deal with. Becoming human, what it meant for sonship. I know that you dealt with sonship in Theology 1, at least I think most of you did. And so I'm going to summarize it here very briefly. There's sort of an interplay between the two syllabi here. In wrestling with the relationships within the Trinity, the idea of sonship is to be explained. <coughs> Quite obviously, there are dynamics of fellowship within the Trinity. Why? Because it's a relationship, there's three people. Yeah, there's three persons. 
So there will be the dynamics of relationship, the one to the other. And that obviously is something that's been there for all eternity. It remains in the mysteries of God, exactly what that interaction was anyway, the fullest extent of it. We do know that there was obviously something laid down with regards to the plan of redemption, the coming of the Son, the laying down of his life, those things that are part of the decrees of God concerning history can be either seen in scripture or surmised. But that's obviously not the fullest extent of the relationships within the Trinity. Christ is the Son of God. That appellation, that title, is far too clear on the pages of the New Testament in particular for us not to accept it. He is the Son, but I guess the argumentation or the debate or the discussion is when did he become the Son? The when of sonship, I've called it, eternal, historical particularity that is in time and history only. I think you can isolate three different ways in which this relationship is expressed relationship of Christ to the Father. I've listed them like this, sonship by eternal generation, sonship as an eternal reality, and sonship as an incarnational title. Just those three. Psalm 2 verse 7 features in all of them. Psalm 2 verse 7. has raised a number of questions in its own. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, Hayom, today I have, Yalad, begotten you, ask of me, etc. It's the portrait of the Son in the four portraits of Psalm 2. You have the portrait of a very troubled world in reaction against God and his anointed. You have the portrait of an enthroned sovereign who will carry out his will. You have the appointment of the anointed king, the Son, and then the portrait of a submitted worshipper responding to the truth of the Sovereign Lord and the Anointed Son. This day is taken as being something other than a time designate. It can't mean pointing to a particular day because that would be out of step with the eternality of God. So it, it must be eternal. It's, it's interesting. The decree of God is an eternal decree. Therefore, Christ is eternally the Son. The difference between eternal reality and eternal generation is the process or the explanation, description of that sonship by means of generation. Strong, page 340, said the sonship of Christ is eternal. It's most naturally interpreted as the declaration of an eternal fact in the divine nature. Hayom can mean, very simply, a time, a day. It can have it's a valid translation, checked it with Dr. Berwick. Now the day came, for example, in First Kings, First Samuel 14. Hang on. The day came that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man, etc. 
Now, a time came when Jonathan said to Saul, what a day came. You can see the same in Second Kings 4 verse 8. Now there came a day, a yom, when Elisha passed over to Shunem. There came a time, a day. And there was a day, Job 1 verse 6, when the sons of God came to present themselves. There was the time when this was done. I think it refers to something specific. I don't know that anything has been resolved by appending the adjective eternal to the decree and saying that Hayom doesn't mean some particular time, moment, event, however you may describe it. It is at that point that something was said you are my son. Eternal generation has been defined by Birkhoff and I find it a very difficult definition to accept. It's sort of come down through the ages and it's one of those terms that we just now use. But think as I read from I react to the definition. It, it doesn't sound right. It is that eternal and necessary act of the first person in the Trinity whereby he within the divine being is the ground of a second personal subsistence like his own and puts the second person in possession of the whole divine essence without any division, alienation, or change. What does it sound like? You're in... Ashley? Yeah, it, it has that uncomfortable feeling. What have I got here? Of the first person of the Trinity somehow giving source or beginning or personhood, personal subsistence, to the second person. In fact, eternal generation of the Son is often explained not only as the necessary act of God, but an eternal act of God the Father. generation of the personal subsistence rather than of the divine essence. I don't quite understand. It is a generation that must be conceived of a spiritual and divine. So what does that do? It leaves you with that uncomfortable feeling that we have a definition that implies origin or beginning. Bancroft follows similarly. Jesus Christ was the only begotten of the Father, being begotten not in time but in eternity. Theologically this truth is called the eternal generation of the Son. His Sonship was the infinite and positional relation which he sustained to other members of the Trinity from all eternity. So here we have an idea generation but that can't mean beginning so we'll stick eternal on the front of generation make it eternal generation and that'll shift it back as something that's always been and we overcome the difficulty it's not generation see it's eternal generation and the word generation actually starts to have different meaning than begotten or genau I still feel that eternal generation leaves unless you take the time to give some further explanation leaves you with an uncomfortable feeling of inferiority of the one to the other. Since 
time to God is the eternal now. We can just simply move away from today, this day, and don't see it as any specific moment. With regards to the word begotten, if you have your Hebrew text there, but you'll notice that it's in the Cal. It's a Cal perfect with the second person suffix. It's not in the Hifl. The Hifl stem is used for paternity, for begotten in the sense of father begetting a son. The Cal stem is used with your land to talk about relationship with people and is actually used figuratively to speak of a city or a nation giving birth to its inhabitants, not the Hifl. So if you check TWOT and some of your other lexicons, you'll see that they refer to Psalm 2-7 as your lads pointing to a relationship between the father and the son and actually speaking specifically of a relationship of love between the two and interpreted in the New Testament as clearly seen in Christ's resurrection or session at the Father's right hand. So only begotten points to generation, but not in the sense of father begetting son, as would normally be, that would be in the Hifl, in the sense of one relating to the other. And the Son of God, as a title, expresses an eternal relationship to the Father. But what you have is a context of non-generation, generation, and process or inspiration. It's usually the construct in which you find it. So what Origen used as a phrase was intended to denote the inter-Trinitarian relationships, a sonship that was there prior to the incarnation. In fact, always was there. And you have to remember something else when you're talking about eternal generation, and, and it's this. This is what makes it somewhat distinct from e eternal reality. Is that the early Greek fathers were trying to sustain, to maintain, to defend monarchianism, or at least a strong emphasis on monotheism. One God. Yes, the Trinity, but one God. And so they carried the distinction of Father and Son back into the Godhead with that desire, good desire, to maintain monotheism, to make these distinctions reconcilable with one God, not having three gods arising therefrom. So it was the theology of the Trinity Father and son were roles that would be played and adopted as the plan for the for history was worked out by the Godhead. And the definition giving subsistence to the second person was to God monotheism. And you had the structure develop. Actually, if you remember from historical theology, the Cappadocian fathers were the ones that proposed non-generation for the father, or the father is unbegotten. Okay, there was another phrase that was used. The son is begotten or generated, generation. You see something of a superiority, inferiority, at least I do. Non-generation, generation, and the spirit proceeding from or spirating from, and so your older textbooks will use procession or spiration to refer to the spirit in relation to the father. Actually what it is, is a phrase used as part of a temporal mission of the spirit is, is taken and just out of context. It's a phrase borrowed from a verse of scripture and taken to describe the inner relations 
of the Father and the Spirit. John 15, 26, when the Helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. I took that word, it's ekporiomai, and, and just simply took what described temporal mission. He's been sent on a particular task and applied it to a description of relationships in the Trinity. Interesting. Obviously not good hermeneutics. It wasn't intended to be an interpretation of the verse. It was to borrow a term to describe something. A corollary, perhaps, of ontological relationships has been expressed in this phrase. I don't think I asked you to read John Doms's article, but I've referenced it here for you. An article called The Generation of the Sun that he wrote in 1989. His argument is that unless you have fellowship and interaction between the members of the Godhead, they really are not persons in any sense of the term person. Because emotion, intellect and will suggests communication, dynamics of relationship. But he wants to take the dynamics of relationship and push subordination back into the Godhead itself. Not in terms of role, but in terms of ontological subordination, hierarchical subordination. He says the New Testament emphasizes the divine activities of creation, revelation, redemption, and judgment. And the Son always functions in subordination to the Father. That's fine. There's no problem with observing that the Son is carrying out the Father's will here on earth, that a plan has been fulfilled. He says, if the Bible teaches eternal generation of the Son, and it does, then he wants to hold, which, which he considers a reasonable extrapolation, that eternal subordination goes hand in glove with that eternal generation. So he ties the two together. He says, if you want to talk eternal generation, and he, of course he is, then we will talk eternal subordination at both economical and ontological level, both on the level of essence, or being, that is, and the level of function. Two other men came out with a similar article in 99, Kovach and Shem, a defense of the doctrine of eternal subordination of the Son. So I was very interested to, to find when this landed on my desk at the time, I remember saying, yeah, this looks like a good article. Hermeneutical bungee jumping, subordination in the Godhead. It's a catchy title. It takes you right into it by Bill Zikian, 97. Good reactions. Co-substantiality, co-eternality, and co-essentiality excludes any form of ontological hierarchy or order or ranking pertaining to their eternal state, to the usia the essence. In fact, I would put in at this point that co-inherence, I don't know if you use that term in studying attributes of God and the Trinity, co-inherence applies. Co-inherence or circumcession, as it's called, means that each of the persons, each hypostasis, is a complete manifestation of the divine essence in every respect. So, just pull this diagram back into your memory. <coughs> the Father is fully God. All the attributes of the divine 
belong completely and fully to the Father and they belong to the Spirit and they belong to the Son. If you were read through Gridham, and I should have brought those diagrams, the Son, the Spirit and the Father are not portions of the Godhead. They are fully divine, having all the divine attributes. It's called coherence or circumcession. The Son is not part of God, nor is the Spirit part of God. All three hypostasis persons are fully God. Not modalism, but three persons in one essence, co-inherent. I like Bill Ezekiel's second point, at least the second point I'm giving him in summarizing his article. Self-humiliation is a far more appropriate term than subordination, <coughs> like the idea, because it ties back to Philippians 2 verse 8. He humbled himself. Let's use the kenosis to define economic subordination. Nobody subordinated him. He was originally subordinated to no one. He humbled himself and wants to focus attention upon that, that's fine. It is humiliation. It is the form of a servant. It is the setting side of equality with God. And then he notes reciprocity is the consistent mode of interaction within the Godhead until the end and into eternity. And so if you're going to talk subordination, um, notice the point he makes. It must relate slowly to Christ's incarnation, that is, a functional or economic subordination wherein the kenosis does not affect his essence nor his status in eternity. And we discussed the fact that in becoming the Son, in becoming man, that is, in the likeness of flesh and as a slave, it never affected his status as God, never changed his essence at all. He always was, always is, always will be fully divine, yet subordinate carry out a particular function. Those are three points that bungee jumping article makes, but there's a fourth one. Christology which minimizes the majesty and lordship of Christ. Now he's assuming that by talking eternal subordination that somehow you are minimizing majesty and lordship. You are carrying back the suggestion of a subordination that is more than economic into the Godhead. By reducing his ministry to that of a subordinate function or a ministry accomplished out of subordination, he sees this as a deviation from biblical truth. He's pretty strong about it in his wording. And he adds, I think a little sarcastically, maybe the word little should be taken out. The ministry of world redemption must not be reduced to a little side project that could be delegated to the services of a subordinate deity. That's sarcasm. Probably out of place in the, in the article. So his advice at the close of bungee jumping is one, don't mess with the Trinity. Blunt statement don't mess with the Trinity let's not denigrate in any way or appear to be denigrating majesty and lordship he must be exalted in fact he points out that after the kenosis the Lord was the Lord God Almighty was eager to exalt the Son again. 
and the Son desired the glory which he had with the Father beforehand. He sees the desire to honor the Father and the Father to honor the Son. is pointing to equality and not subordination before the incarnation. Second point he strongly says is let's quit talking about subordination. Now that's obvious because he's made that clear from the very beginning of his article. Have any of you read the article at all? You didn't have to read it in Theology 1. We're going to have to suggest to them you read it. Let's quit talking subordination. He doesn't like the term. It's obvious that it's, he's allergic to subordination. It scares him. It scares him because he sees it's setting up a trend, pushing in the direction of Sabellianism or Arianism or some other way in which the person of Christ is going to be redefined. And thirdly, he says, let's not push, let's not use God to push our ideological agenda. That we have a point to make about subordination, so we'll use God to make these points. Let's deal with the text, stay with the kenosis. Yeah. Paul. Um, the course on biblical manhood and womanhood um, with Wayne Grudem, and I believe that Bill Zakian may have been one of those that holds to the opposing view from what we would take at the seminary. Yeah. And I wonder if maybe he um, sees subordination as almost being equal or synonymous with inferiority, whereas we would not see it as an inferior role, but as a submissive role, which is you know equally... Yeah, that's wrong with that. you know that's possible because a lot of these things kind of mesh together in a man's thinking, one acting upon another. If I may put it like this, theology is to some extent a waterbed. If you push down over here, it kind of moves over there. The, I, the, that's an interesting thought. I, as far as I know, he is on the other side. But I, I pick up the warning that he sounds in, in ignoring the sarcasm. I want to be absolutely certain that in the discussion of sonship, I do not imply inferiority, an inferior role. And second, I want to be absolutely sure that I don't imply some suggestion of a beginning that I've resolved by putting eternal on the front of it. And I know what's going through your minds, I'll pick that up just now. I want to be absolutely certain that I do exalt the Lord Jesus Christ with his role and position and equality in the Godhead. So the warning sounds well, it just says to me, and this is what the article did. It said to me, be careful how you deal with this particular subject, that you stay within the parameters of Scripture as much as you can, recognizing that some inferences are made from time to time. Yeah, somebody, John, was it you? Yeah. Matt, I mean. Uh, yeah. Um, so th this article by Doms, he was saying that that uh, there's not only economical subordination, but there's ontological subordination. Yeah. If I can find the article. Don't have it with so me. He wasn't, yeah. just, he, he wasn't just saying that there's eternal subordination economically, but there's eternal subordination ontologically. Ontologically. Yeah. Just a... <coughs> So I understand it because I'm having a tough time. I'm always having a tough time. Sonship by eternal generation means that Christ has always been the Son, and He's always, in a sense, proceeded from the Father. Not proceeded, but always from the Father. Is that what it always just? It's always been like that. Is that what it means? The the presence of the word generation is a pointer to the way the definition is going to go. That the first person of the Trinity. Remember the exact phraseology on that first page? First person of the Trinity, by a necessary and eternal act, put the second person 
in the ground in position of the personal subsistence like his own. It's terminology that suggests some sort of begotten or source or origin. That's what eternal generation means. Somehow, by an act, the father gave subsistence to the son. That's generation, but since it can't be begotten in time, let's call it an eternal begottenness. And the terms that we use was unbegotten for the father, begotten for the son. So there was a setting up of some form of ranking. That's what Blazikian is reacting to. And it, that definition I ever stuck, and it just came down through the systematic theologies, so that the standard definition was how do you express son in relation to father, eternal generation? And then they just simply picked up on procession and spiration for the spirit and talked the same way. John 1 verse 18 is used in eternal generation to speak about the eternal, the only begotten God, the, op the alternative reading in John 1 to show that the son was the son before, even while he was God. <coughs> and 1 John 5.18 is also to show equality with God fully beforehand. So it's not an ontological subordination. And 1 John 4.9, I don't know if you have 1 John 4.9 in there. You may have 1 John 4.4, 4. it should be 1 John. 4.9 talks about the only begotten Son. That's eternal generation. Now the important point that I made at the end is this, that it's stuck. Okay? It has become the standard traditional expression in the different creeds and systematic theologies as the way to explain or to describe is a better word the relationship of the son to the father in the Godhead and, and that's what it is it's exactly the same as John 3.16 it has stuck so we, we always say what that he gave his only, and you automatically say begotten, especially if you cut your teeth on King James. And it's only when somebody finally tells you that begotten doesn't mean beget, because it's a single nun, not a double nun verb. The only unique, one of a kind, only son. But it's stuck, so the term is now used with a different meaning than the norm. Then you get to talk about sonship as an eternal reality, which basically is a reaction to the phraseology of generation. Again, Psalm 2, verse 7. John 1, 18, John 3, 16, gave his only begotten son, saying he obviously was a son when the father decided that he should be given as the saviour. Colossians 1.13 speaks about the kingdom of his beloved son. Same emphasis picked up again that he's obviously the beloved son at the time that the planning for the kingdom was made. Sent forth his son, born of a woman, Galatians 4.4. 4. Same emphasis, therefore already son when the decision was made. And similarly for 1 John 3.8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. The Son of God appeared. Okay. And that that must obviously be referring to what he was at the time he appeared. In 1 John 4.10, that we talks about this is love, that we love God. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation, sent him who was already called son. 
as the propitiation. Same reference to today or this day. Not a, and particularly an emphasis on not his coming into existence, but of what is the case. He's being the sun. Cellar and showers. And you know, I want to react when I pick up this book because if you know Reynolds showers, you're kind of a little surprised. Eternal sonship of Christ seems to have had a particular focus. It was looking here at our pulpit and the man who stands in it. When God broke, brought him forth from the womb of the earth and publicly decreed that he is who he always was, that was the resurrection. He always was the Son of God. It's who he is not what he became. Don't talk about him becoming the son. That makes him something that he wasn't before that time. Father, son and spirit are words to indicate eternal relationships within the triune Godhead. Conveying personal relationship without in any sense, Boswell says, of involving subordination of any or generation. In fact, Boswell acknowledges that it may be just a little radical to say Dispense with generation. Let's get rid of it. Yeah. I, I have a tough time seeing the difference between eternal reality and eternal generation. Yeah, the difference is only in the fact that generation is used and is and has the definition of the first person putting the second one in possession of the personal subsistence like and design. So the, the, the only way to, do, to see the difference is this one has been used in such a way to protect monotheism and have the first, second and third persons in the Trinity relating to each other in terms of begotten. There was an emphasis on begotten. Father's unbegotten, son is begotten. But it must be an eternal begottenness because you, you have a problem otherwise. So it put eternal generation on the side of protecting monotheism and having a definition that needs explanation. Talks about the necessary act. And you try to define, this is not a beginning, this is not a source, this is not an origin, this is eternal. As an eternal reality, doesn't have that emphasis on generation, on the first person's necessary act, eternal act, within the Godhead. He's saying there always has been Father, Son, and spirit. In, in bottom line definition, there's very little difference. But you have to see the substructure behind it. So he always was the son, and one always was the, the... The father was always the father, the son was always the son, the spirit was always the spirit. Father and son related to each other all the time, both eternally and now. There's never been any doubt that he was the son. There's a desire in this one to not speak in terms of become son. It did become a subordinate role played by the son in coming as the redeemer. But he always was what he is declared to be. Okay. Sonship as an incarnational title is the way I've tried to describe this particular point. It's that which was proclaimed by, or at least used by, Dr. MacArthur. Before the incarnation, Christ was eternally God. Sonship is an analogy understand the essential relationship and willing submission to the Father for the sake of our redemption. Here's his quote from Galatians. It was that quote in Galatians and I think in Hebrews that ignited the reaction of a man called Zeller. This is being taped so I suppose I should be careful what I say. Zeller has a lot of zeal 
for criticizing others. He, uh, well, uh, I have an illustration that I'm not going to use on the. It's it's a, it's the guy standing with the shotgun fully loaded, and he's scanning the horizon. And if you just pop up in the wrong place, wham, and then poof, ready for the next shot. And and that's my description in a nice way. So he saw something that ignited his reaction and he was pretty upset. Jesus was not eternally subordinate to the Father, is the stress made, equal to him, yet submitted himself, and that's basically an e a statement referring to the kenosis, as an obedient son to a father. So all these terms like generation, submission, age, are elements of subordination and are really not applicable to the eternal relationships within the Trinity. If you use them, you use them with some uncomfortability because they suggest what apparently you, you don't want them to suggest. As I said to, to Steve at the break, these words say, they sound like this, but don't let them sound like that. It's not what they mean. Actually. Uh, Christians 15, 28 talks about how yeah. Christ puts everything here. He will subject himself to the Father. Is that, is that an eternal thing? Or no, that that's... Uh, that's I've got a response to that. It's taken by men like Doms and others to mean ontological subordination at the end that what is an economic subordination now is going to continue as an eternal subordination to, to God. However, think about that. Just, I mean, just stop and think about the statement that's being made. You're looking at the study Bible, I think you'll see an excellent footnote there. As to what it means. You got the study Bible? I don't know what you have. No. It makes the comment that obviously it cannot refer to a subordination that strips him of his deity. In essence, he remains the same. But he continues now to reign for eternity in accordance with the Father's wishes, even as he remains fully God. So the doctrine of an absolute Godhead requires that all its members be absolute, no hierarchy imposed upon their relationships at all. So he remains the same, fully God, and he reigns eternally, and in that sense, subject to the Father in terms of what he does. His reign doesn't stop, remember, Revelation makes that clear. So he's not speaking of the essential nature of Christ or, or the Father, he's speaking of the work that Christ had accomplished and will accomplish and that now comes to fruition moves everything to the point now where God is fully, all in all, in every respect as he was before time and history began. <coughs> so the mediator, actually I'll give you a cross-reference here that you can look up, gross Hader in NICNT, dealing with 1 Corinthians has a short discussion on that. Gross Hader, NRCNT, page 369 to 370. You want me to spell that guy? If that'll help. Gross Hader, in the Netherlands. NRCNT on 1 Corinthians. Or Leon Morris, 
in the Tyndale commentary. Page 218 also has a little explanation. Not the essential nature, but definitely speaking of the work, and that's the whole context, the work that Christ had accomplished and will accomplish. He had been subject to the Father to do that work and bring it to a consummation and hand everything back to the Father. The mediator lays down at the feet of the Father. At the end. <coughs> Lay down his office at the feet of the Father when he finished his work. Doesn't conflict with his eternal kingship, which is referred to in Second Peter 1. The goal of the subjection here is that God may be all in all. No opposition anymore. God's glory will be then fully accomplished when all resistance has been frustrated by the mediatorship of Christ. The one before all will kneel. But you know from Philippians that's Christ as well. He will be in all that is, with all in the sense that he will rule them and possess them. No room for anyone except God and Christ who rules. In subjection to the will of the Godhead. That's the short explanation given in the study Bible as well. So, when you stop to think about deity, immutability, essence of deity, it can't mean ontological subordination. It is a whole total change of everything with, with Christ till the eternal king. So economic subordination in terms of a role that continues. Yeah, yeah, acceptable. There are a number of other passages too, actually, Ashley, uh, that, have, that have been put forward. There's a whole host of them. In fact, most of them that are put forward as implying subordination are verses that describe Christ as the Son during the kenosis. And it's quietly forgotten that there are also verses describing him at that time as being equal with God. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. Those type of verses, the ones that proclaim his deity. And there are those that proclaim his service to God the Father, which all point to the fact that there is a role that's been carried out. So, point of this view, which is frankly gone. Not sure anybody really holds to it. Father and Son have no significance before the Incarnation. What you have is more of a look back titling. Can I put it like that? You're standing here reading a record, looking back as to what was there before. How do you describe who Christ was in eternity past in the Trinity if you don't use the terms that have now been used? So the Old Testament usages are prophetic. They look ahead to the one who is the coming Son. Even Proverbs 30 verse 4 is not problematic, as some have tried to make it out to be because it's probably more genealogically related than, than anything else. It, it's a point that was made by some. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Significant questions. What is his name or his son's name? No, that doesn't have to be a reference to the son that is to come. Because Jewish genealogy would say, what is his name and what's his son's name? For more specific identification. So it's not that problematic. Old Testament sees Yahweh son, Yahweh father interaction. Future tenses used in the New Testament. Will be great, will be the son of the Most High. In the words of the angel. Son defended the deity of the one who had veiled us in becoming man. 
And so I called it historical particularity. I didn't find that term anywhere else. I was sitting thinking about it. How do I capture this idea that the sun is only during the incarnation? It's historical particularity. At this particular point in history, he is indeed functioning as the sun in a subordinate role economically. But you know as well as I do that as a result of tension, questions, and non-angry requests, somewhere I've got it here, MacArthur carried out a, a re-examination. It was a re-examining of his position and his explanation, which is a mock of humility and a desire to say, okay, I don't, I'm not here to upset anybody in understanding who the son is, so let's re-examine this. Stress the co-equality, co-essentiality, co-substantiality, co-inherence of Father, Son and Spirit, and acknowledges at the end of his examination that theologians have labelled these properties paternity, filiation, inspiration. That's non-generation, generation and procession. Such distinctions, that such distinctions are vital to our understanding of the Trinity is clear from Scripture. There is the Father, the Son and the Spirit. How to explain them fully remains something of a mystery. Many aspects of these truths may remain inscrutable forever in the mystery of God, in his secret understanding. Basic understanding of eternal relationships within the Trinity nonetheless that has been used represents the best consensus of Christian study over the centuries. I therefore affirm the doctrine of Christ's eternal sonship while acknowledging it as a mystery into which we should not expect to pry too deeply. That's fine. That's probably what you should just put as a label across the whole thing now. Eternally son, with a particular role that was paid, played in history and time, that the purposes of God for eternity future might be carried out. When you remember that John Walford listed in his book, Jesus Christ our Lord, some six or seven, six other ideas of sonship that were used, you understand it is not as easily settled as you think. By baptism, by resurrection, by exaltation to the right hand of God, by title or office, son of God, son of man, or by means of covenant relation for some. So I want to acknowledge that. There are future tenses used. There is one coming who is the Son. There does appear to be a Son before he came, the title applying to him as Son of God. So there is historical particularity where there is a clear subordinate role. There is the title Son for one who is fully God, eternally God, never any question about that. So for me, I do not use the word generation because it jars in my thinking. If I read it or I have to use it in some context, I stop and say, let me explain what I mean. This doesn't mean beginning. It doesn't mean origin. It doesn't mean source. The words seem to suggest that, but you can't allow yourself to go in that direction, so redefine them. It is better just to say, he is eternally the son. Let me explain a role that he played. Actually, you'll find this mentioned in some places. And based upon, I'll move it up shortly. Based upon the prepositions in 1 Corinthians 8 and Ephesians 2, a diagram is, a triangular diagram has been proposed. One God, the Father of whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things. And then add that with Ephesians 2, for through Christ we both have access by one Spirit 
to the Father. So they take the of, through, by, to, and come up with this diagram. It's what I've called functional subordination. Diagrammed as follows. Father, initiator, receiver of the plan. Of him, through the son, the mediator, by the spirit, the agent, back to him, the father. Explaining subordination, functionally speaking. There is a ranking in that sense. Of the father, through the son, by the spirit, to the father. And using those two verses to suggest that it's not an exegesis of those verses. It's not a hermeneutical, sophisticated argument from those verses. It is using prepositions to say, see, we can perhaps describe functional subordination like this. Leave it as that. Interesting. The father does appear to initiate. The son is indeed the mediator. There's no question of that. And the spirit is indeed the agent carrying out God's plan. There's no doubt about that. And certainly it all comes back to praise to the Father. At the same time, don't forget this, standing behind it. What they are and what they are not. Here's one final one. Let's see if you can follow it. Need to zoom in. Let's do it like this. If you have no ontological equality, then not all the members are fully God. Coherence is absent. Not fully. Not all manifesting deity. If no economic subordination then you have no distinction of persons. Stressing here, eternally subordinate, son to the father. Father is not eternally the father. Son is not eternally the son. So on. <coughs> Trinity is not eternally existed. Now notice what I've taken this from bungee jumping, I believe, thinking about it. If if you don't have an economic subordination, you don't have some distinction that can be used. And that role of the sun could be more than just history and time. No inherent distinction of persons, and there is. So there is an economic subordination, and there is ontological equality. The Trinity has eternally existed, so the formula that's used can be this. Eternal equality in being, but subordination in role. Shut the door. Okay. Almost at the point where I'm ready to say, forget the discussion on the sonship. It's taken an hour and a half. The final conclusion is, there's a role that's carried out, there's a plan that's accomplished, there's three that are equally God. Do you have questions? You bet. Do you understand every verse that deals with this? Not yet. Have you got a good grasp on the Trinity? You bet. As much as possibly one can get from the study today. Yes, you know what? This is the case. You want to say this carefully, don't misunderstand me. This is a case where you carry an, a pencil and an eraser. And you say, oops, erase and sharpen, not redefine, sharpen the definition. Then in three years' time, you're reading again and reflecting upon something in the old terms. Say, erase, hone and sharpen the definition even more. That's probably the attitude you should have. What does it mean for sonship? Significant, but 
don't make it a bigger problem. Okay. But in my exam, and in my presence, if you don't want to irritate, don't use the word generation. If you do, redefine quickly. Got to come to the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. Far more thrilling subject in terms of weighing the importance or qualities of different sections of Christology. I've decided to deal with them sort of en bloc for now. Uh, three historical events are referred to constantly in the Word of God and we're not able to look at all those verses but the importance of this of course is the frequency of mention they are foretold in the Old Testament uh, very often, Isaiah 52, and I think it's correct, Isaiah 52, verse 13, which is where the section begins. Isaiah 52, verse 13 through 53, 12. If you are going to preach on Isaiah 53, start at 52, 13. Don't start at 53, 1. You have... I guess what you could call the three prefaces introducing the Messiah from the prophet Isaiah. Fascinating passage of scripture and you probably know that it sits at the very heart of the way in which the second half of Isaiah is divided. In actual fact verses 4, 5 and 6 of 53 are slap bang in the middle. You don't want to make too much of this as though it was a particular structure set up that way. It's just interesting that right in the middle section is the clearest definition of substitutionary atonement that you can find. All three, death, burial and resurrection, seen as belonging to verses 13 through 15, setting the stage for what is going to come in chapter 53. Incomparable success this one will have, verse 13. My servant will prosper, suffering servant, remember. Inexplicable suffering in verse 14. Astonished, marred beyond description. An indescribable glory referred to somewhat enigmatically in one or two phrases in verse 15. These are taken as revealing the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of the Messiah. Foretold in the Old Testament, there was this servant coming to whom this would apply. His death is referred to in Psalm 22 and Daniel 9, also clearly marked. His resurrection in Psalm 16 and Acts 2, Psalm 2 and Acts 13, dealing with sonship psalm 2 pointing specifically to the resurrection very clearly the son of god in victory perhaps you can add for death zechariah 12 and zechariah 13 zechariah 12 10 and zechariah 13 1 and 7 zechariah 12 10 they will look on me whom they have pierced they, whom they put to death this, this is I'll pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supp supplication so that they'll look on me whom they have pierced something coming in the in the future remember that and he sinned is the Lord. Chapter 13, verse 1. In that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David, 
for sin and for impurity. And then verse 7. Against the man, against my associate, declares the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered. And of course, it's use in the New Testament. Taken as a reference to the death of the Messiah. On resurrection, you can add quite a few. I put down Genesis 22, comparing it with Hebrews 11.9. Connection automatically made in your minds. Abraham and Isaac, the lamb. Genesis 22 and Hebrews 11.19, that is. Hebrews 11.19 and perhaps Romans 8.32. And I shouldn't forget, you, know, you shouldn't forget, I mean, you, you have to make a choice about what verses you're going to include in a listing. What would be one of the clearer references to resurrection in the Old Testament? Yeah, if, if I was to ask you, what's a very clear reference to resurrection? The particulars of what resurrection that is are not going to be given, but the idea of Coming back to life again. You tell, what did you say, Chris? Psalm 16. Psalm 16, yeah. Job. Job. Job 14. Shall he live again? Job 19. Job, Job 19 is what you're thinking about. Out of my flesh, with my own eyes, I shall see the Lord. Go a little later in Revelation. These words, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Daniel, Daniel 12. So you can add Daniel 12 for a plain expression of, res of resurrection. And Job 19. I guess Psalm 16.10, the emphasis would be more upon you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay, suggesting very strongly, of course, that death will not hold him. The only escape would be rising back to life. Isaiah 53.10 is also seen as referring to the resurrection. The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, but in the preceding context, he's been buried, he has died. Ascension is seen in Psalm 68:18. Psalm 110, one with cross-reference to New Testament passages, usually taken as referring to the ascension. You have to think about it, I think, to see the connection fully. It's foretold not only in the Old Testament, but foretold by Christ himself. When you think about the texts in the Gospels on the death and resurrection, on ascension, you have Christ's explanation. Matthew 16, we won't turn to these passages, but there's clear explanation given after the confession about Christ. Do you remember? So you don't have to turn to it because the passage probably sh should come to mind. Matthew 16. 16, remember? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and, and two statements are made, be killed and be raised on the third day. Very clear explanation. And that's when Peter said, hold it, can't be, just can't be and gets the rebuke from 
from Christ because Peter was not understanding the things the way God understood them. Matthew 17, clear promise after the transfiguration. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them saying, tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man, and that's himself, they knew that, has risen from the dead. If you look at Luke 19.31, you'll remember that the three, Christ, Moses and Elijah, discussed what obviously is the resurrection. Speaking of his departure that was about to be accomplished in Jerusalem. Speaking of his exodus. So the words used in the transfiguration account are the exodus for the resurrection. Departure. Matthew 17, 22. Clear instruction on the gathering in Galilee. Meet me in a certain place. While they were gathering together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of God, man, is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they'll kill him, and he'll raised again on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. Clear instruction given at this gathering in Galilee, although they were also told to meet him later. On the way to Jerusalem, after the Last Supper, again, clear information. Resurrection will occur after death. Enigmatic statement of the temple cleansing in John 2. And the purpose clearly declared in John 12. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Could refer to nothing else other than the full accomplishment of the plan of God, both in terms of death, burial and resurrection. Okay, it's clear. It's a good introduction to an Easter message. To whip through Matthew 16 and 17 and see. Clear words that apparently in the crush of the moment and the pressure of the time, the disciples didn't always fully understand. It came back to mind later on. On the ascension, but, but we have the privilege of reading those words. John 7, John 8, John 14, John 16, all references to that. It's an event obviously distinct from the resurrection. And you'll, I hope you'll see that more clearly after you've read Kenneth Daughters. This entailed him going back to the Father, not just rising from the dead, but going back into heaven where he said he was going to go. Although apart from the resurrection, it would not be at all. Without the resurrection, there is no ascension. To go to the Father means to come back from the dead. You can cross-reference to an series of articles on Christ's ascension by Peter Toon. I'll give this to you just to add to your bibliography. Peter Toon in Bibliotheca Sacra of 1983 and 84. Bibliotheca Sacra 1983-84 it's, it's volume 140 and 141 of 1983 and 84 on historical perspectives on Christ's ascension. If you're really interested in historical theology, it's a good four-part article to refer to or put on file. It's called Historical Perspectives on the Doctrine of Christ's Ascension by Peter Toon. Specific testimony was also given of death and resurrection by the angels in the tomb, by the disciples on the Emmaus Road, by 500 eyewitnesses at one time. Fascinating. By Peter in his preaching, by Stephen at his martyrdom, by Paul in his teaching on the kenosis. Very specific testimony. Christ has risen from the dead. <coughs> and an important footnote. You may have forgotten. Maybe you have always remembered it. It was years. It must have been about the tenth time I was reading the Book of Mark. It suddenly struck me. 
Pilate checked with the centurion that Christ was indeed dead. It had totally missed my mind in previous years. I never heard it mentioned. Called the centurion and said, is this guy dead? Why call him? Well, he was a soldier. He would know what death was. He would be able to confirm, indeed, not yet alive. Important footnote, so that there would be no suggestion after he never really died. A centurion verified his death. And then the body was released to Joseph of Arimathea. That's an important footnote, isn't it? I find that to be, find that to be so now. Verification before release. They buried a dead man. Not a fainting man. Or a man in a... What's, what's the word? No, what do you call it when a guy goes into a... Coma. In a coma. Not someone in a coma because of pain. There was no heartbeat. There was no life. There was no breath. <coughs> they really did bury a dead Jesus. I'm the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Close, close with these words from R.A. Torrey. Remarked at the resurrection was, and he used three phrases to describe the importance of the resurrection to our faith. When you look at the testimony, the foretelling, the confirmation on death and resurrection, he said, one, it's the cornerstone of Christian doctrine. Deny the resurrection, you've pulled the cornerstone out of the foundation. It's the Gibraltar of Christian evidence. It stands like a rock unmoved, un unwearing. It's there. It's the Waterloo of infidelity. I mean, these are descriptive phrases. The cornerstone of Christian doctrine, the Gibraltar of Christian evidence, the Waterloo of infidelity. Well remarked by R.A. Torrey. And we'll close on that. <coughs> 